check, check. Can you guys hear me? Uh, great. So fair warning, this is the first time I've ever done a talk, so I'm incredibly nervous. And I hear there's a, um, an exception for first time speakers where you can't heckle me. Uh, so I'm going to have to kind of uh, invoke that privilege, um, at least this time. Um, and today I want to kind of dive into a little bit of the history of programming, a little bit of the history of web design, um, and hopefully uh, get some ideas out there to get you guys thinking about um, how we can think of the true future of web design. Not a year out from now or a couple months from now, but uh, maybe 10, 20 years from now. Um, and I want to start by just telling you um, the story of two different designers. And you know they're designers because they're wearing you know, trendy glasses. Um, and these two, so Sergi and Matthew, are both designers by training. Uh, they don't code, they can't write, I mean, they don't write code, uh, they can. Um, and both of them had a very similar idea. Uh, Sergi had his five years ago, and Matthew had his one year ago. And what happened with Sergi is that he, um, he spent a lot of time uh, doing um, missions and he would see people uh, kind of in pain and saw that he could do something to, to ease that pain. Uh, and his idea was, why don't we kind of create this, this uh, crowdsourced way for uh, other people to pitch in on other people's ideas and, and sort of crowdfund a way um, to get people out of poverty, to uh, set up certain groups with you know, some equipment, to basically do good, good work in the world. So he had a bunch of designs, uh, made this Help Riot brand, um, created this landing page, actually got it out there on something called LaunchRock, started collecting emails, uh, went through the entire process of designing a site. Um, he knew exactly how it was going to look, how it was going to work. Um, and then he just hit a dead end. He couldn't find anybody to help him with the code. He couldn't afford, he was in college, so he couldn't afford uh, a developer. And the project essentially died. He went to work um, at a bigger company, and then, you know, uh, as time goes on, he sort of uh, let the idea go, go by the wayside. And Matthew was in a very similar position. Uh, after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, um, he had a chance to visit, along with his friend Brett, um, and he saw this happening. Um, a ton of people were displaced. They, had to s they were set up in these, uh, what were supposed to be temporary tent cities that um, were supposed to last a couple weeks, but they ended up living um, in them for years, and people still do. The vast majority of people who were displaced are still living this way. And th like this is just one little tiny area of just tons of people being displaced. And he, he went there, and he had a heart for these people and just saw that you know, people living in these tents, entire families, uh, living in extreme heat, um, he thought maybe there's something that we can do about this. Uh, but he's, he's an apprentice at this uh, UX agency in Atlanta. He doesn't really have design, I mean, he has design chops, but he can't code. So he doesn't know uh, what to do really. So he finds one family, and he has this idea, why don't we build one family at home and see how that works? Um, and there's like these basic brick buildings that go up for $5,000, which is nothing compared to the homes that we live in. Uh, so he has the ability to, um, happened to be with Webflow, but he had the ability to create a test site that looks like a Kickstarter. Um, completely, I'll explain how this is done, but it's completely data-driven and content-driven. He just sets up, um, a family and what a family looks like. A family has a goal, a family has uh, a description and uh, like a, an image. Um, and then each of, the, each of the families, he first set up one and he created this video and it's totally like, you could say that it's a fake website. Um, and he got one home funded. And that, while he was still working at this agency, it just gave him like this huge boost of energy because now he changed the life of one family. Um, so they kept doing that and doing that. Eventually, one family turned into three, then it turned into five, and then he said, wait a minute, maybe I can make, um, my, like, maybe I can make this my life's work. So he, he, built, on more to, like, he built more onto the site, and they, they went from five families to 10 to eventually 136 families with over $800,000 raised uh, directly to fund these homes. They built an entire city. Um, and, and changed the lives of at least 136 families in Haiti. And now they're moving on to Nepal, et cetera, et cetera. So he was able to take this idea and 
test it out very quickly without relying on a developer and take advantage of the power of the web uh, just by building for it directly. Um, so the, the main difference between Sergi and Matthew is just the timing. Matthew had the ability to do this uh, and, and work directly with the web, while Sergi was a little bit early. Um, and so what's the difference? In both cases, they're both not coders. They're, after talking to both of them, they're both afraid to code. They're intimidated by just the vast uh, amount of information that we need to know in order to code. And for, for the huge uh, chunk of the world, code is like this entirely different cryptic uh, language that um, is so far away from what they naturally understand. It's not, it's not the same as you know, like what we think of like English literacy and uh, where even kids, elementary school age kids can sort of grok it and understand it and do it naturally. Um, and we can teach it with simple concepts. It's not like that. There's so many parts around code that you have to get everything right uh, for everything to work correctly. And this is a scary slide to me. Um, this powerful medium that, that we get the privilege to build uh, for is accessible to less than a quarter of 1% of everyone in the world. So like if you went to a party um, with 100 people um, there at that party, like this much of one person <laughs> would know how to code. Uh, unless you're in Silicon Valley, in which case there would be no party in the first place because everyone's coding. <laughs> uh, but everyone in Silicon Valley thinks that everybody knows how to code and should learn how to code because you know, they know how to do it. And, and, and me, I was privileged to learn how to code in uh, 1999, I had Dreamweaver. I, I had to know like 20 HTML tags. CSS didn't even exist yet. And as new technologies came out, I sort of learned them piece by piece. And a lot of us in this room had that privilege. And people starting today, they get met with this. Like, oh, you want to design for the web? Learn uh, like all these tags. Here's a neat cheat sheet. This is all you need. Oh, you want to learn CSS? Here, here's like you know, everything you need to know about layout. Um, and then, oh, you want some JavaScript on that? Start, you know, here's a couple books to learn that. So then, once you learn these three things, boom, magically, you're a web developer. JK, you, uh, you actually need to know a bunch of other stuff. And if you get one of these pieces wrong, good luck with that. Like, find a developer friend or you know, start figuring all this stuff out. And for some of us, it might not be intimidating. But for 99.75% of the world, um, it is practically intimidating. We can see by the fact that code has been around for 80 years and still such a small fraction of the world knows how to code, um, that's a scary statistic to me. Oh, and by the way, once you like, set all this stuff up, you now have to design for like 1,000 different resolutions. So go learn uh, responsive web design. Um, and, and once you're done, you, you make all these unique layouts. Uh, <laughs> uh, so how do we get here? Like, I, uh, web design, I think, is just an extension of how we traditionally tell computers how to do stuff. And the way that computer programming started is we would give these you know, UI-less machines instructions and then come back later and see the output of those. We would say, here's some instructions. You do the computation, I'll, and then show me the result of those. Uh, and then people thought that, well, maybe that's too complex, you know, writing a machine code. So they created something called Assembler, which made it a little bit easier, and they were like, you know, people who wrote machine code, they said, oh, people who write assembler, you know, they're not really programming because, you know, zeros and ones, that's programming. This is not really programming. Like, this is kind of cheating. Um, and then, so we have, like, this basic model. And then, you know, new computers come out, and they get faster, and uh, we get UIs. But still, uh, the, the process is still the same. Like, we're still writing code, and then we're coming back and seeing what it does. Um, and then we invented something like C, which takes assembly code like this uh, and makes it a little more human readable. But then people who wrote assembly, they were like, no, 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 this is not how you program. This is how you program. Uh, this is for, you know, like, you can't have bespoke assembly when you're writing this, right? So people were really attached to the way that they were working. Um, so now we have the same thing. Even today, with almost all the programs we write, for the web, um, for, for phones, for desktops, it kind of works this way. We give computers instructions, then we come back and see, is that what, what I intended? So the interface to our, uh, the things that we're creating is code. And that's not traditionally been true for a lot of mediums. And um, a medium is something that you have like direct interaction with, um, and that you have 
like this human tactile connection with. Um, and even if um, you might not directly, let's say you're, you're making um, a clay pot or you're writing a novel, you still have that direct connection to the words being written on paper that once they're done, that's the creative work. You don't have to go through an intermediate uh, translation process uh, to, to get your, your craft and your, and your work out there. So we have, you know, painting, you, you paint directly on a canvas. When you're playing music, you, you, you um, touch, a, touch the guitar and you can already hear some sound. Um, when you're making, you know, a, whatever you're, you, like you're directly, directly manipulating that medium. Um, so this is true across all creative art forms, uh, with the exception of web design. Because, and I'll, hold on, I'll, I'll get to that. And we've been in this uh, situation so many times. Uh, back in the time that sheet music was invented, most composers, uh, what they did was they thought, they composed music in their head, and they, they wrote it down, they played it in their head, and then they gave it to uh, an orchestra to perform. And all the people who couldn't do that, all the composers who wanted to play uh, on the piano directly to sort of like uh, get to a composition by feel or, or just by, by hearing, they were looked down upon because they're the ones that couldn't comprehend this entire you know, musical system in their head. And then over time, we actually made it more and more accessible to, to learn an instrument just by playing it and eventually get into some of the more advanced concepts. Uh, same thing happened in desktop publishing. It used to be that you would uh, create these paper layouts and give it to a print setter, and uh, that person would take that work and translate that to uh, something that a machine, uh, a print system can understand. And we had all this separation between the artists uh, in print design and the people actually transforming that into the final product. So there's this whole translation layer that slowed things down. And today we have InDesign, where you essentially you press a button and you get a PDF that goes directly to the printer. You make a mistake, you re-export another PDF. You don't have to like, go to another person and get approved for some, you know, some misspelling or a character moving out of place. Same thing happened with Pixar. When um, Pixar was initially started by mathematicians, uh, these are you know, people who are computer scientists, they understand, uh, understood vector math, they understood um, this thing called non-uniform rational beast blinds, NURBS, of how like shapes uh, form and how light bounces off of them and, and how all this works mathematically. But then when artistic uh, people came into and started thinking about how do we get, how do we tell stories through the medium of 3D animation and 3D modeling, we created a direct uh, medium for those creative people to work uh, in, that, in that sphere. We didn't force them to learn about polygons. We didn't force them to learn about you know, the physics of how life reflects, uh, light reflects off of certain surfaces. Um, and at times when we really needed to get technical, we would bring in experts to build things like hair systems, to build things like um, you know, particle systems, and, and those experts would build uh, natural human UI around those systems to make it um, uh, configurable and pluggable in a, in a user interface, not in a programmatic fashion. Um, so you don't see things in like 3D animation software where we say, oh, this hair system has this API and you have to write all this JSON to configure how it, how it works. It just doesn't work that way. Right now in, in 3D animation, we just work directly with, with the art that we're creating. Same thing happened with, with blogging. Uh, in the late 90s, only you know, on the order of five to 10,000 people blogged because you had to know how to write HTML, uh, you have to have a server, you have to know how to FTP the stuff, you have to know uh, how to sort of um, write all the code to make that happen. And those people who did that, um, if you were to ask them, is blogging hard? They would say, no, I can do it. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. But the thing that um, I think we were missing at that time is how many people are intimidated by even that small level of technical um, sort of uh, know-how to, to write something in a text editor and send it to a server and, and set up a domain and make it happen. So when Blogger came out, it completely democratized the, um, the practice of uh, personal publishing. And it was literally orders and orders and orders of magnitude more people that had um, both the privilege and the power to express their thoughts on the web. Um, so this is kind of like a little, little cheeky um, walk through other creative tools just to show you how other creative disciplines uh, have moved, sort of leveled up to uh, create a direct interface to their medium. Like you have a uh, 3D, and I just put these in alphabetical order just because web designers come last. Um, uh, 
But try to notice the pattern here. Aside from the fact that they're all dark, try to notice the pattern. We have like 3D animators, 3D modelers. They work directly in, in the medium. Uh, grading artists, you have Photoshop here, illustrators, uh, level designers, you have particle effects artists, uh, photographers, they work directly with, with the, uh, the thing that they're creating, uh, print designers, texture artists, video editors, visual effects artists, you name it. And here we have web designers. Um, I mean, <laughs> this is a web designer, and 90% of the time we're in a code editor. Like that, I think, is, is something that we have to at least question. Uh, why, is, why is it um, the state of the art, the status quo, that, that we're the only industry that um, is a creative art form, working in a direct medium, uh, and we're still writing code to express our thoughts? Uh, so I want to show you a little uh, tiny glimpse of, of a, something that, that we've created that moves us closer to um, to this world of directly manipulating the medium of the web. And uh, just by way of example, um, I want to show you this, this site that uh, was built by an agency. This is a sandwich video. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but they make a bunch of startup videos. Um, and it's, it was built by an agency for like more than 20 grand five years ago. It's not responsive. Uh, they want to add more dynamic content to this thing, like testimonials, and they want to make it um, legible on phones. And the agency basically says, oh, that's not the way it was built. We have to rebuild the, whole, the entire thing. Um, so what we did was we rebuilt the entire thing uh, down to the database, up through all the responsive layers in less than three hours. Um, and the way that works is we rethought what it means to work with content. And, um, the, and the extent of that is that you express to a computer uh, to a system like Webflow, what the structure of a content is. And humans are like inherently wired to think about objects uh, and about like how things behave and less about giving instructions to a computer, uh, which is usually what we do with, with HTML and JavaScript and CSS. So here for, for Sandwich Video, they happen to have projects and companies and people, and each of these things is vastly different. So companies have all these properties and people have uh, other properties. So if I was to say, you know, let's say they want to um, add events to their site. So I can just say events, um, and I'll have an event, um, and events have a thumbnail image, uh, maybe they have a uh, date, and uh, perhaps they are led by a person. So uh, all of a sudden, I'm creating a relational data model. Uh, lead person. These are the kinds of things that people currently do with uh, by by create like directly creating. Uh, database code, or um, I think you guys heard recently where you have to bootstrap something like um, you know, Drupal or WordPress custom post types, which it, you need like experts to do that, and it takes months and months of effort. So now I can create a new event. So I'll just say uh, feature web design New York, um, and it happens to be today. Uh, so I've just started prototyping out my content. And this is the real content. This is the actual database. And once you have it, that's, the, that's sort of the easy part. Once you have that, right now we need developers to grab that data, somehow like, issue a SQL query, translate that to HTML, loop over the data that you have, s set filters on that data, and then convert that to HTML and CSS. Uh, we rethought that entire process and just said, why can't it be as easy as dragging in a dynamic list uh, which is a, um, a natural primitive when you're thinking about uh, user interfaces. And I'm going to say this list is going to come from my list of projects, and I'll give it this layout. And just for um, sake of demonstration, I'll limit it to eight items and sort them by um, uh, most recently created. Uh, so now, now that I have this um, sort of like the building blocks of that, I can start building entire... Uh, layouts off of that. So I'll say this image is just an image tag. We'll actually have its source come from the thumbnail of the project. Uh, and I'll add another image here that will come from a different, it, it doesn't come from the project, it comes from the project's link company, which w when we're talking about SQL, this is like a join and you have to have um, uh, an expert programmer sort of know the query that you need to write. Except here, I'm just expressing the type of UI that I want. And you can see that everything reflows naturally like it would in a browser. So I can just now um, give this uh, logo a class and give it a little margin um, and then go to uh, the wrapper. 
give it a class, and do the same thing that I would do with CSS, is just give it another CSS rule. And then, uh, you know, obviously I have to make this responsive, so I'll give this a width of 33% um, in my tablet breakpoint, um, and then here I'll have two of them side by, uh, sorry, two of them side by side, and in my phone, uh, things don't, actually let me make sure that everything looks fine. Um, switch to my phone and make sure that they stack. Uh, so now I've created an entire dynamic responsive design. As I get more data, so let's say I change this, um, this from newest to oldest, right? I have completely different data, and as new projects come in, these reflect right away on the canvas. I'm working directly with the medium that I'm creating for, and to prove that, I'll publish this live, and you can see, if you go to the sandwichvideo.webflowtest.io site, uh, here's the layout that I created. It's uh, completely responsive. Um, and as I add new projects, uh, they'll automatically appear there. And I can go um, and give a link to my client. So talking about CMSs, um, by separating the content from the design, but still keeping the link between them, I can now uh, just give my client a way to say, okay, you have access to just the content. You can add new content. You can change content directly on the screen. Uh, so I'll just change this to one card. And you can see immediately, it's reflected anywhere that that data is used. So I'm working directly. I never have to go back to a code editor. I never have to think like, oh, how is this going to translate from the code that I write to how it actually looks on the screen? I'm actually directly working uh, with the thing that I'm designing, which is what every other creative medium, medium does. And I'm not saying like this is the perfect solution, but it's one step closer to, to realizing an idea um, that matches every other, every single, um, every other creative discipline that, that we practice as, you know, as humans. Um, and I think that's a really powerful, um, powerful way to think about the medium of the web because we don't know how many Sergis there are out in the world. Like the only reason I know about Sergi's project is he happens to be my brother. Um, we, I have no idea if there are thousands of, um, of people who had that idea before but just weren't able to build it. Um, and it's, it's super exciting for me to see like people like Matthew take their ideas and just run with them without having to rely on a middleman or somebody else telling them, no, you can't do that, or yes, you can do that. Um, so you'll probably see this slide tomorrow. I, I took that picture in the San Francisco one. Um, so Jen Simmons says this after um, she talks about Flexbox and you know, float layout. So we have to sort of change our thinking b between float, because just like we changed from tables to float-based layouts, we should sort of change our thinking from float-based layouts to Flexbox and CSS grids and um, things like that. But I want to challenge that even more and just say, like, why do we need to um, express our artistic ideas in what amounts to be instructions to a computer? When there's um, the potential of other, other ways to, to work more directly in the medium. And this is another um, slide that I borrowed from Jen's talk. Um, I think the, the reason that a lot of programmers back in the day when machine code uh, came out and then assembly came out and then C came out uh, were just very protective of the work that they've done uh, was because they, they were afraid of, uh, of new ways of doing things. And I think that once we, once we lock that out of our minds, like if we assume that code is always going to be the way that we interface uh, with the web as a medium, um, I think there's so much potential that we could be missing out on uh, because just by virtue of us being in that tiny little sliver of humanity that knows how to code, it's easy to sort of like pigeonhole ourselves into that, um, into the, th the type of thinking that if I can do it or if I was able to learn, then everybody should be able to do that. And I think that's something over time, as we've seen more of these like code schools and um, you know, uh, attempts to get people to code more pop up, uh, the actual percentage of people who know how to code as a, as a function of the world's population has dropped. Uh, so people are learning to code slower than, the learn, than they're, they're actually being born. Um, and this is an interesting example that Brett Victor gives. 
this is what you used to know, uh, used to have to know, uh, to do uh, multiplication in Roman numerals. So this was like the de facto way that you did multiplication. Um, and the only people who could do do this type of multiplication were official mathematicians in the Roman Empire who like go through extensive training. Um, so like multiplying two numbers like this would be uh, a crazy process where you would have to, you know, like instead of carry the two, you're like carrying the triple C and like moving the L. Um, so to most people, like when I show my wife how I build websites, that's what building websites looks like to her. I'm just moving numbers around. I'm, I'm not really, like it's, it's hard for me to explain what an action, like what result that has without jumping around um, from, from place to place. Whereas if I show her something where I can directly manipulate a medium, whether it's 3D animation and I'm moving a ball up and making it bounce, um, or I'm, uh, I'm working directly in a browser through Web Inspector or through, through Webflow. There's a direct uh, connection to the medium. So I want us to think about whether we're, we're like too, um, too tied to this, you know, to this thing that, that we call HTML and CSS. And, and the other privilege of um, giving a talk for the first time is that I was told you get to make up a word. Um, so I made up this one, super medium. Um, hope it sticks. But I, I just had this idea this morning that the web is this crazy medium that can represent every other medium. Like we can represent print on, um, on the web. We can represent film on the web. But no other medium can represent the web. Like it can't fake the web. So this, the web is the first time that we have access to the entire wealth of human knowledge um, on kind of the read side. We can go read it. But it's also the first time that we have this, this incredible privilege of being able to build something, to create something, to write something, to, to draw something, and get the entirety of humanity to, um, to be affected by that work. Um, and right now, the thing that I'm afraid of is that almost all of that power rests in the hands of the privileged few. And many of us are in that privileged few. Um, and I think that it's something that we should start thinking about. How do we get this amazing power? Do we hold on to it? Or do we, do we open it up to more people? Um, so I keep, I keep going back to Sergi and um, Matthew's stories. Like, how many of these guys are out there? How many people have ideas that are trapped um, that, that they just completely discount the fact that they can do it just because they don't know the technical details uh, to go from ideation to getting uh, the actual product out there. Um, and I think this matters, like you can see from, from Matthew's work in Haiti that this isn't just like a website that we're creating for a pizza place down the street. This has tangible real life effects on, um, on other people. Like the web has literally changed the world and some, sometimes, you know, for the worst, but on the, like in the vast majority of cases for the better. Uh, and I think when we um, open up this power to this insane new medium to a lot more people, to the 99.75%, uh, to build like really custom things, to the things that they can imagine, uh, that, that they can already uh, kind of map out on a piece of paper and describe exactly how they work and exactly how they look. If we give them the power to actually make those things happen, I think we can have a, a huge um, impact on the future of the web. And if you think about uh, one of the videos that, that was on um, the the website for Future of Web Design um, was the history of film was that for the first 30 years, film was entirely silent. And everybody assumed that movies are silent, right? And, and people who made silent movies were kind of like, this is how we make movies, right? Um, and then we democratized the creation of movies. First, we added sound. Then we made uh, movie equipment cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now we create hours and hours of video content, um, entertaining, informative video content, um, just by virtue of uploading something to YouTube. It's, it's available to all of humanity, um, and, and how many people's lives have been changed through that? So that's what I want us to start thinking about. Can we, can we open up this, this amazing new medium to a lot more people? Thank you.